Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. What a, what a treat we have to, to be able to study it and allow the Lord to point things out. Uh, I want to I reference a, a conversation I had last week, uh, not to critique anyone's, anyone's uh, observation, uh, just, to, just to use it as, as, as a teachable moment here. Uh, after service, one person who's not here today, by the way, just, just came to that particular service, and, and they said, this is just so great. I so enjoyed this morning's message. I so enjoyed our time in God's Word. The Lord has had me in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 for the past couple months, and I've been reading them every day. And, 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 then, and then this person got kind of a disappointed look on their face, and they said, I just don't know why I didn't see all those things that you shared. I said, I I didn't say anything. I just kind of smiled. But see, God has designed the entire journey of every Christian to need help. What I I could have said is, is, ma'am, If you could get everything that's in that Bible out of there for yourself, then the Lord who designed and who is building the church would have made an awful mistake placing apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers in the church to equip you. You'd just self-equip. And you wouldn't need anybody else. Now that is, by the way the deception that many have fallen into. I don't need church. I don't need a pastor. I can read my Bible for myself. Now, this person, by the way, is a seasoned minister with over 35 years in ministry, but came to church with a Bible and a notepad and received instruction. Couldn't figure out why they couldn't get it themselves. But again, if I could get everything out of there myself, Uh, I don't need the body of Christ. I don't need the ministers that he said in the body. Uh, I'll just do my own perfecting. I'll do my own equipping. I'll do my own edifying. I can't do that. That's right. He hasn't designed that to be so. That's right. And so thank the Lord for every good minister, every qualified, every anointed, and every called minister. And, uh, And I personally thank him for everyone that's got the sense to tune their television set in or, or, or in old days, buy a tape. You know, I think we can still get books, if I'm not mistaken. They're not all E. They're actually still print some uh, and, and can come with an open and receptive heart and, 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 and realize that, wow, the Lord loves me and, and, and actually put gifts in the church uh, to edify and equip and, and, and build up and prepare for good works, for the works of the ministry, uh, different, different ministry gifts. So thank God for every one of them. Here we read some of the last words of Jesus. We read in Revelation chapter 1 that John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's there being persecuted. It says in verse 9, for the testimony of Jesus Christ and for the word of God. Verse 10 says on the Lord's day, even though he was out on a deserted island, and even though he was left there to die as a form of capital punishment, uh, he, he, it was the Lord's day, so he got in the spirit. He started worshiping God. He started praying. He started praying, and 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 he heard a voice behind him. He heard a voice behind him, saying, "I am, I am, I am the Alpha and the Omega. No one else can claim this. I am the first and the last. What you see, write down. Send it to the seven churches." And he names the seven churches. He names them. You can say what you want. You can believe what you want. I'm not responsible for what you believe, and I'm not responsible for what you say. I'm responsible for what I believe. And I'm responsible to, pro- pro- to proclaim to you the truth of God's Word yeah. and everything he, he, he desires you to hear and desires you to receive. That's my responsibility. 
but it's not my responsibility whether you receive it. It's not my responsibility whether you ever act on it. That's not my responsibility. That's yours. Amen. And there'll still be people who want to argue and say, well, there is only one church. Well, apparently Jesus didn't know that because he said right here in the 11th verse, he said right to the seven churches. And then he named which ones that he wanted them sent to. And he said, send, send, send it to the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those were seven geographical locations, seven cities, seven communities. And there was an assembly of Christians, an assembly of believers. Now, one of the things that has taken place many, 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 many multiple times in the centuries since Christ's resurrection in the first century and since the first century when this was written is something called church splits and spinoffs. Now, there have been a lot of church plants like the one that you're sitting in in 1983 and even in 82, plans were underway to begin a new church, to start a new church as an outreach church. Uh, and, and that's how this one church, this church started. It didn't, didn't start out of a split. didn't start uh, out of a group of people that, that left one to start another, that were disgruntled, that were offended, or that just wanted more and, 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 uh, and wanted more freedom to worship or truth. There, there's not always bad reasons that, that, that churches start. But at this time, there, there was only one church. When the book of Acts was first written, and it said that the Lord added to the church, uh, that was because there was only one. There's only one group of believers on the whole planet, and that was the believers. It started with 120 of them. The first church had 120 members. It was in an upper room. That was like an attic. They met in the attic. They didn't have air conditioning. And on the day of Pentecost... 120 were still up in that upper room and they were still meeting and praying and worshiping and praising and the Spirit of God fell like never before and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost is what, what the Bible says. From that point on, the Lord began adding to the church and as you read through Acts 2, Acts 4 and 5, you see the church is growing. Acts 6, the church, the number of disciples is multiplying. They have to establish deacons uh, to serve in the church and things like that. And it wasn't until Acts Acts chapter 8, that, that Philip, the evangelist, that, that he ministered to the, to the Ethiopian eunuch, he went down into Africa, evangelized the whole, the whole nation, and the whole nation of Africa still draws its roots from one person who traveled up to Jerusalem, and on the way back met a Christian, wow. met a Christian who shared Christ, baptized him in water, and then was caught away, and he went right back down to, to, to Candace, the queen, and, and it covered the whole continent. Uh, the uh, the the next chapter, the, the eighth chapter, is where the Gentiles for church uh, first received proclamation and preaching. Was he went down and he started preaching in chapter eight, a little earlier than that. And then they sent Philip, uh, excuse me, they sent Peter and John down, and they prayed for him, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they baptized a bunch of them there. And then Cornelius's household in Acts chapter ten. And Cornelius' household, uh, everybody, he, he got everybody together. I mean, it was like the church picnic, and he invited all his friends, all his relatives, all, his, uh, all of his staff. He, he had 100 soldiers under him, so we know there was 100 people there because he just told them. He didn't ask them. He said, you're going to church. Kind of like being a kid raised in, you know, in, in a Christian home. You don't get a vote. Right. How, how come it got so quiet? I'm here. You parents don't let your kids vote whether or not they come to church, do you? No, no. They, they, you know, he had 100 men under him. They do what he said. And, and he, he had them all there. He had everybody there. And, and, I mean, God just opened heaven and filled them all with the Holy Ghost. And the Gentile church was started then. And, and we don't have it on this list, but there was a church at Centuria. Uh, and history tells us, not the Bible, but history tells us that Cornelius then became the second pastor of that church and continued to serve God. He's one grateful, appreciative man. And he just says, what can I do? What can I do? For God's came, not what can God do for me, but what, what can I do for, uh, for him? And he started serving God. Well, as the church continues to expand and grow and other places of, of, of uh, civilization, uh, other civilized communities and cities and towns, uh, then churches began to spring up because of the, uh, the work of people like Philip, because of the work of people like Peter and John, because of the work of the Apostle Paul. And Paul wrote letters to all of those churches that he started. 
And then he was an apostle, and that's what he did. He found the church. He'd pastor it for a while. He'd find a young person like Timothy or Titus. He'd, he'd install them and put, put them in. Uh, and then he'd write to them from time to time. And that makes up our New Testament, some of those letters, some of the questions that he, he, he spoke that they were wrestling with. Uh, as a church, some of the things that were out of order in some of those churches, some of it is is outstanding, uh, just eternal revelation of truth. Some of it is just real practical things, like tell those two women to get along. Amen. Oh yeah, that's the book of Philippians, fourth chapter, where he has to stop everything just to encourage two people to put their differences down and quit bickering with each other and and get along. It's hurting your church when there's disunity and disharmony like that. And and fight for unity. And, yes. and, and so he wrote letters to those churches that he started, like Philippi, like Colossae. Galatia was a region, like the Cooley region or the Seven Rivers region. And, and he wrote to the churches of Galatia. And so there was even more churches right in that in, entire region. But here in these communities, there's one church per community. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God only recognizes one church per community. That, that, that's a human doctrine. That's not a Bible doctrine. That's something that somebody came up with. Uh, but, but we don't see it in the Bible. As time has gone on, uh, there became two churches and communities, and then four, and then six. And uh, I don't know how many we've got in this community in, uh, in, in, in La Crosse. I, I, we were visiting a, a community uh, not too awfully long ago, and I looked up. There was over 450 different churches in that community, in that community. Well, how many of you may think God recognizes? Well, I don't have anything to say. He doesn't recognize them all. Right. In this time, it says there was one church in each of these communities. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The next thing we see <clears throat> is that there were seven messengers in those seven churches, one messenger per church. One messenger per church. There were seven golden candle stands with, with a lamp or candle fire on the top, alive, like Minister Trailer mentioned this morning, living, alive, vibrant, uh, shining light, uh, and, and uh, influencing the environment around. Those are churches. That's what churches do. Seven golden candle stands or lamp stands. And then there were seven stars in his right hand. See, those seven stars don't belong to the churches. The seven stars weren't plunked on the top of the candle stand or hung on the side of the candle stand. They were in his right hand. They're his choosing and they're his establishing. Uh, and there's not one human being that has anything to say about it, including the messenger. That's good, Pastor. Including the messenger. And so he has those seven stars in his right hand, verse 16, and he's standing right in the middle of those seven golden candle stands. And it describes what he looked like. And he speaks of himself. Uh, there in verse 17, 18, 19. And then he shares the mystery of what he's looking at in verse 20. What the seven candle stands or golden lamp stands are and what they represent. And then what those seven can, uh, stars in his right hand are. And then we notice in chapter 2, verse 1, as he continues through, now he's going to dictate these letters. These letters are called epistles. That's a letter to a church. And so he dictates, first of all, to the messenger of the church at Ephesus. And he, he points out all these things that he's doing right. How many things did he do right? Ten. There were ten things that he said. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you don't bear, you can't tolerate them that are evil, uh, that, that you've discerned those who say they're apostles but actually are liars. You have patience. You've labored. You've not fainted. And verse 6, you hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and their, and their deeds. But remember that there was one thing, even though there were 10 things on their good list, uh, on, their, on their nice list, there was still one on their naughty list. There's still one on the, on the portion of the list that said, you got this to work on. And if you look at what he says, he says, if you don't repent of this, I'll come quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place. It doesn't take the devil to shut a church down. The Lord right there said, you started off loving me, and that was your motive for everything you did. Your works, your labor, your patient endurance, your discernment, your intolerance of evil, all that's wonderful, but you're not doing those things like you did them in the first place. In the first place, you did them because you love me. 
And it's a great soul searcher, isn't it? As all of these truths are, it's a great time to examine yourself. Do you come to church because you love God or to soothe your conscience? You put money in the bucket to, 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 to satisfy an obligation that you think you have? Or did you hear that, 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 that uh, uh, exhortation this morning, uh, God so loved he gave? And is that the motive for your giving? Do you serve in the church because it'll get somebody off your case? Uh, I remember uh, uh, Dr. Hagen's son-in-law uh, years and years ago hearing him uh, share, and he was take, just taking the offering. And, and he said, you know, it was, a, it was a conference, and so we had to raise a budget. And we had a certain amount of money that we had to raise, and so we just asked people, who'd like to help with the budget? This is a budget offering. You just tell me what you're going to give, and we'll, we'll, we'll take account of it until we raise the budget for the, you know. And so let's say they needed $5,000. And so does anybody just want to give the whole budget? That would just be done. And, and, and nobody did. And so, well, we'll just, anybody want to give half the budget? Anybody want to just give $2,500? Then we'll raise the other time. And nobody did. Say, so anybody want to give $1,000? There was somebody who gave $1,000. And then there was somebody else that gave and gave and gave and gave. And they got down to $500. And, and he just tried and tried and tried. And nobody either had it or, you know, willing to give it. Uh, and, and, and finally he said, well, one person stood up. He said he was a pretty big, robust man. And he said, preacher, if it'll get you to shut up, I'll give the last 500 bucks. He said, well, put your money where your big mouth is, write the check and bring it up here. And so he did. And he said, he, he talked about sowing and purposing in your heart, in your sowing. That guy, he didn't even get what he purposed in his heart because what he wanted to do is get the preacher to shut up. And all he did is get the offering over, and then the preacher started. <laughs> but he did get him to shut up about money for the budget. And, and, and so he, that was a good exhortation there about, you know, why are you giving? Why are you giving? That guy, the only reason he gave is to just get the preacher to, to move on with the service. And then when he brought it up, he, he brought it up and he, he threw it in the bucket. And he said, now just stand there and let me talk to you for a second. Everybody here ought to recognize we could have been through this 15 minutes ago if you'd have done that with the right heart instead of making everybody sit here that whole time and, and, and now you do it just to get me to quit talking about money. You could have gave it 15 minutes ago yeah. with a good heart. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you think I'm pretty straight. <laughs> Why are you doing what you're doing? That's the whole question to the first letter there to the Ephesian church. He said, you left your first love. He said, you need to return to your works like you did them at the first. Come on. And if you don't, see, see, they were doing them out of habit. They were just doing them because they, they learned how or they needed somebody. You can, you can have a good motive for anything you do. You can have an appropriate and proper motive for helping people, for giving, yeah. for attending church, for worshiping, for, for, for praising the Lord, for, for, for reading your Bible, for serving in any capacity. Yeah. Do it because you love God. Yes. Do it because you love God. Good. Yeah, just do what you do because you love God. Amen. Second church, verse 8, the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna. He starts out the same way here. He starts in every single one of these letters. I know your works. I know your works. And then he says, I know your tribulation. See, the Lord knows what you're going through. It doesn't matter if everybody on social media does or not. The only one who can help you does. Yeah, he, 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 he's, the, he's the one who can help in, 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 in anything. And he already knows. And then it says, I know your poverty, but actually you're rich. I hope you caught it. I talked to our children just a little bit about that this morning. That there's poverty that human beings judge as impoverishment, as lack, as little. And, and, and there's true riches that humanity knows nothing about. The third letter is the letter to Pergamos in verse 12. Uh, and he says the same thing. He says to the majority of these churches, but I have a few things against you. 
and he talks about that doctrine of the Nicolaitans and how it started all the way back. And we went back and we looked at Balaam and Balak. And, and it's a way of getting people's attentiveness and focus and heart away from God. The mechanisms aren't nearly as important as the outcome. The mechanisms are nothing but the, the, the bait that people take and then draw them away from God. Now, you can look at the, at the couple of things that's part of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which has been around as long as Balaam and Balak, or you can look into society today. You can look at things listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3. See, one of those is lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure, that means just doing things that make me happy, doing things that make me feel good, doing things that I enjoy, rather than putting my God first and foremost in His cause in everything. In everything. That's just as much of an idol. That's just as much of an idol. Our Bible says money can be an idol. You realize you don't have to have any of it to love it? You don't have to have any money to love money. But, uh, but, but he said the love of money. The love of money causes people to fall into many hurtful and foolish lusts, into traps of destruction, and draws them away, causes them to leave their faith. So there's a lot, a lot of, uh, of things in our Bible. Uh, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take a stone object that you bow down before and, 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 and burn incense and chant in front of them uh, to, to be uh, idolatry. Idolatry is anything. We looked at uh, a verse in book, the book of Acts last week. It says they, they rejoiced in the work of their own hands. That was an idol. When they got done, when, when you step back and say, look at this wonderful thing that I've made. Look at this wonderful thing that I've done. And don't give God the glory for that. In the Bible, in the book of Daniel, it says Nebuchadnezzar stood right out on, the, right out on the, 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 the edge of the wall at the top of the city and said, look at this mighty city that I have built, that I have erected. He gave God no glory whatsoever. And the voice of God tumbled out of the heaven while the words were still in his mouth and said, I'm going to take my hand off you for seven seasons. That's like spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, and for seven seasons. I'm going to take my hand off your life, and we'll see, we'll see what you can do without my help, without my influence, without my presence, without my wisdom. Heathen king, and yet God's hand was still upon him. And God took his hand off of him, and that day, he fell on all fours and began to crawl around and lick the dew off the grass and eat grass like an oxen. And that lasted for seven seasons. And the Bible says when those seven seasons were done, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. That is an act of humility. That's what Abraham did. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. And when he did that, the hand of God came back upon him and his entire kingdom was restored. And, 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 uh, we made, no, we'll just do it right now. Turn back to Daniel. Amen. Turn back to the book of Daniel. Come on, real quick with me. Amen. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Tell me when you found it. Amen. Tell me if you're looking. All right, we'll give it another, another minute. If you found it, you, you can see right there uh, the thing, some of the things that I just shared. That Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he walked through the palace and, and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by my might of my power for the honor of my majesty? Isn't that arrogant? Yeah. Isn't that arrogant? Better be real careful because... It, 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 it's not too hard to look at the family album and say, look at this wonderful family that I've built. Look at these wonderful children as they're out there on the athletic field or up there blowing their little tuba or, or playing their drum or, or play, acting in the play. So, oh, look at this wonderful child that I have raised. And everything that, that, that is worth anything, you have to know that you had God's help yes. and, 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 uh, uh, and acknowledge that, that in all your ways, acknowledge him yes. and he'll continue to direct you along life's way. Yes. Continue trust in the Lord with 
all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Where's that in your Bible? Proverbs 3, yeah, 5 and 6. Uh, acknowledge him always. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that. Proverbs hadn't been written. He didn't have a Bible. Uh, but as the word was in his mouth, verse 31, there fell a voice from heaven, said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom is departed from you. And they'll drive you from among men. And, and you can read it for yourself on your own time. And, and, and verse 34, at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I love this because this is a man that flopped. Yes. This is a man that yes. failed. This is a man that lost everything. And this is the man writing this chapter. Everybody wants to put their best foot forward and look their best for everybody and play King Saul in 1 Samuel 15. So well, let me just look good. You know, I know I'm losing the kingdom, but let me just look good. Nebuchadnezzar's telling this. This is his own story. You there with me, Daniel 4? Read verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God has worked toward me. How great are his signs. This is a heathen king. Come on. Wow. By the time he writes this, heathen no more. Yes. He'd met God. Yeah. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. See, he's writing all of this. He's telling his own story. This is autobiography. Yeah. And he gets down to, he says, the dumbest thing I ever did was when I looked out at this great city. I built for my own majesty, and a voice from heaven fell. And so this isn't some crazy Pentecostal preacher pointing out what somebody did wrong. This guy's telling his own story. I walked uh, seven, seven seasons past, and, and I ate grass, and, and body wet with dew, hairs grown out like eagle's feathers, nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and whose kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his own will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, why do you do that? At the same time, my reason returned, and the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my brightness returned. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to humble." All that put themselves up, he's able to bring down, to, 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 to make low. That's a, that's a, pretty, good, that's a pretty good preaching right there. For, for a man not even saved, not even filled with the Holy Ghost. See, anything can be an idol. He talks to numerous of these churches about idol worship and, and the roots of idol worship. And, and the next church, the same thing in Thyatira. I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, your woman, I, you, 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 you allow your wife, the Aramaic Bible says, to teach and seduce my servants. And it's the same thing. We see it again and again and again and again. And it turns people's hearts away from God and it turns them toward idol worship. Then we hit chapter 3, the church at Sardis. In the church at Sardis, and he says, you have a name, you have a name. Now, again, that may be reputation or it may mean the actual human name. Name may have been Hebrew, Shaba, or, 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 or Greek, Zoe. That, mean, that, that name means you're alive. And if he is addressing the whole church, it might have been named Living Word Christian Church. Amen. Might have been, your name is living, but in actuality, you've died. Oh my, is, is right. Yeah, it, it, may, it may be in name living, but are you really? 
and, and, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, but in actuality, you're dead. Be watchful. Strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen those things that remain, that are ready to die. For I've found none of your works complete. See, whatever this person or this church started, they, just didn't, they weren't finishers. They weren't finishers. They, they didn't complete things. They couldn't say like Jesus when he hung there on the cross, it is finished. See, his assignment, and, and, and he finished it even after descending and, and after ascending and presenting his blood into heaven. And then even now making intercession for the saints, sending the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. And, and, and so he continues to, continues to work and continues to serve. Uh, but this church, he said, I, I found nothing that you've started completed. Nothing that you began did you complete. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have, remember the two things here? Received and heard. They're not the same. They're not the same. We looked at Philippians 4, 9. We looked at Mark chapter 4, 15 through 17. There's a difference between hearing and receiving. You can hear something and reject it. You can have your hands folded in your lap and a smile on your face on the outside and your arms folded and your head shaken back and forth on the inside. You, you don't have to receive what you hear. You could be daydreaming. You could be working on your grocery list on your mobile device. Receiving and hearing, two, two different things. And if you, you, you haven't looked at the parable of the sower recently, go back and notice it and note it again. Verse 4. There are a few of you in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. Okay, that's where, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> they shall walk with me in white. Why? Because they didn't soil their garments. That's why. How many of you weren't here last week? How many of you were and didn't receive? How many of you need me to share this again? That it's pretty easy to blame other people Pretty easy to put the blame on somebody else. It started, started in the third chapter of the book. Started right there. That's human nature. Human nature is not to take personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is something that you learn. What's natural is blame, blame your little brother. Cain was mad at Abel. He was the source of all of his problems. There are people who live their whole life and they never get figured out. They just never get figured out that everyone else is not the source of your problems. That's right. That's right. I, I've never been so glad as to <clears throat> be raised in a spiritual home and be raised in Christian churches and then come to the knowledge of one message that planted personal responsibility right here. Because then it didn't matter who was for me, who was against me, who, who, was, who was beside me, who was faithful, who was unfaithful, who made it, who didn't make it. None of that matters. When you read in your Bible, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe according to everything He commands you, then all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. It doesn't matter what everyone else does. It doesn't matter what the whole rest of the millions of, of Israelites do. You can be Joshua. You can be Caleb. You can be the one to choose to trust in the Lord your God and be recipients of his goodness and his blessing. And nothing anybody can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. If God be for me, who can be against me? It doesn't matter who's against me. If God be for me, you and God the majority. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who doesn't want you blessed, who doesn't want you healed, who doesn't want, it doesn't matter how many people disagree with God. Let every man disagree with God. Let every man be a liar. God is still true. God is still true. And, 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 and people can do things to kind of slow down and, 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 and hold back the plant, but they, but they can't do anything to keep God's word from being fulfilled and brought to pass in your life by the spirit of the living God. Nobody can hold you back. Nobody can hold you. No one can keep the blessings of God from coming into manifestation in your life. Well, yeah, but, but, but pastor, but, but I'm under 30. You believed a lie. 
You don't think God can bless people because they're teenagers? You don't think God can heal people because they're in their 20s? You, 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 you think the Word of God somehow is categorized? Here's the blessings for men, and here's the blessings for women. Here's the blessing for this race, and here's the blessing for that race. Here's the blessing for people that lived in this generation. Here's a, Well, if I could just have been born back in the 1600s, Pastor, then I know I could have been a successful Christian. But you just don't know how, it are, how hard it is in 2023. Oh, that's right. There is a verse in there somewhere says this will all work until 2023 and then you've all had it you're all going to be on your own by them all of those lies rob you of faith every one of them every one of them no there's no designation in mark 11 23 there's no designation in mark 11 24 there's no designation that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved just whosoever whosoever now, it couldn't keep you from being saved, and that's the greatest benefit, and that's the greatest blessing, and that's the greatest thing the Lord will ever do in your life. That's because God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him would never perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, there are differences among us. We'd be foolish to say otherwise. Everyone's absolutely a unique creation of God. But instead of focusing on those differences, focus on the promises of God and the greatness of God and what God can do and what God will do. Uh, instead of making excuses about, well, they this and they that and they the other. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. This is the victory that overcomes the world. If you were born on the right side of the track. This is the victory that overcomes the world. If you go to the right church. This is the victory that overcomes the world. If pastor would preach better. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even your faith. Even your faith. But see, see, if I want to blame Paula, if I want to blame my children, if I want to blame my, the elders here, if I want to blame my neighbors, well, well, you know, I got into sin because, well, again, that, 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 that's, that's what Adam did. And then that's what Eve did. And that's what Cain did. And that's what humanity wants to do. Well, you know, it's really not my fault. See, see when you get dirt on your garments, it might be somebody else's fault. But when you soil your garments... Does everybody, does everybody just still not get what that means? <laughs> now, I probably shouldn't say this because I know he's watching. But my dad's got this little Santa Claus coming out of the outhouse little deal. You know, like a kid, like a jack-in-the-box or something. You know, you open the outhouse door to see Santa Claus. Open door to see Santa Claus. And you open the door, and there's Santa Claus. He's in a seated position. <laughs> and the noise that comes out of this little outhouse, when you open the door to see Santa Claus, that's like soil in your garments. Okay, it's like... <laughs> You came all the way to church this morning just to learn what that meant. But you see, you can't blame that on anybody else. That's right. Come on. You know, if somebody's making a mess eating beside you. Have you ever raised kids? I mean, you got to apologize when you leave the restaurant, don't you? And there's stuff everywhere. It's just like, did they eat? Or did they just... Spit it all over the floor. Did they throw it everywhere? And if you're a parent, I mean, you, you can't be a parent very long before you. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Buy these real expensive. This was a gift. Came from a great friend of mine. And, 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 and you know, they're silk. And, and boy, you're just so careful. when you. And then, and then somebody at the table. Got to swirl their spaghetti. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you do upside down, it's still, or right side up, you know, it's flicking. And, and, and it's like, excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. And then I'll sit back down because it's getting on you. Yeah, that's somebody else. That's somebody else. I was thinking right there about Bobby Andy and Pastor Andy and pastored in Tulsa, Oklahoma for years, had just a really thick, heavy black mustache. 
And another minister I know was having lunch with him, and he was eating fettuccine. And what was he doing? He's flicking it. And one little corner of one of those little fettuccine noodles, you know, they're about that wide, and, he, and one little corner come flying off and whipped right across the table and hit Pastor Bob in the mustache. And he was petrified. I just hit Pastor with a fettuccine noodle. He said, I didn't know what to do. He said, there it was, stuck on his mustache, little bitty corner of a white noodle stuck on this big, thick, black mustache. You, you ask, you, this is him preaching. You ask, what did I do? I didn't do nothing. I didn't even tell him. We got all done. You know, he, he goes like this. I'm hoping he'll go. He doesn't. He goes. We get up out of the river. I'm thinking somebody will say something to him. Nobody does. Nobody does. He walks out. He goes back. He sits through a whole counseling session with somebody with a piece of fettuccine noodle on his, on his mustache. And then between that and the next one, he went into the bathroom. And he saw it. And then he called this guy and said, did you know that was there? He said, he said, I wanted to lie so bad. I just so bad wanted to just tell one little white lie, you know, and just, just weasel my way out of it. Did I know it was there? I put it there. <laughs> Sometimes there's dirt that gets on your life. All you got to do is just take that old garment off and throw it in the wash. Sometimes there's dirt on, your, on you from somebody else. All you got to do is just get out some soap and water and just wash it off. But when you soil your own garments, you can't blame anybody else. Sin in your life should never be brushed away with an excuse that somebody else did that. Somebody else made me do that. Somebody else is the cause of me doing that. There are a few of you in this church that haven't soiled their own garments, is what Jesus said. And they'll walk with me in white. They'll walk with me in white. For they're worthy. Well, what do I do when I sin, Pastor? Repent! It is so simple. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you will confess your sins, not make excuses for them. If you'll confess your sins, He is faithful and He's just and He'll forgive you of your sins and, and do what? Cleanse. Cleanse you of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out from the book of life. But I'll confess his name before the angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, he didn't say to this church. He said churches. He says it every time, all seven times. These are universal truths for all churches. Now, what does the Bible mean? When it says, I'll not blot their name out. What does that mean? And, and, and is it relevant to us? Well, let's look at a few verses. Uh, first, we'll start back in the Old Testament. We'll have them put them up on the screen. Uh, and, uh, and that'll save you some time looking. But you can write down these references. Psalm 69, verse 28. Psalm 69 and verse 28. It says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Now, there's a very common understanding, doctrine, I would call it, very common doctrine amongst New Testament churches. And it goes like this. Come and receive Jesus and get your name written in the book of life. You ever heard that? Just, just let me know. Anybody ever, beside me? Okay. Is it the worst doctrine in the world? No. It's just not what the Bible teaches. That's right. That's right. It's just not what the Bible teaches. And, and just hang with me for a couple minutes, and, and we'll discover why this is so important. 
Why is it so important that a person's name is already in the book of life and has to be blotted out? As opposed to their name is not in the book of life and it has to be written in. Why, 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 is, why is that so, so imperative for us to have a proper biblical understanding of that? There is a book called the Book of Life. Now, how important is that book? We'll keep that verse. We'll, we'll come back to it. But if you're still in Revelation with me, turn ahead to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. If you remember previous teaching, this is after the tribulation period. The believers are swept out in chapter 14. The final judgments are poured out on planet Earth in chapters 16, 17, and 18. While that's happening on Earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place in chapter 19. And then Jesus returns in chapter 20 and sets up his millennial reign. That's a thousand year reign. After that thousand years is over, Satan is released from the pit and goes about tempting and tormenting and in the final battle is thrown into the lake of fire in verse 10. Now let's start reading in verse 11 and we'll just read the rest of this chapter. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face earth and heaven fled away and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Everybody say books. books. That means there's more than one. Yeah. And I saw the books open. And who's standing before God at the great white throne? The dead, small and great. Now, Christians have already been caught up. That's all the way back in chapter 14. They've already had the marriage supper of the Lamb. In chapter 19, these are they that lived during that millennial period and all the dead previous to that. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open. What was the other book that was open? Yeah, the book of life. We call it the Lamb's book of life. The dead were judged out of the things written in the books. Not the book. The dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. Now, I don't know how many books are in the Library of Congress. Tens of thousands. I don't know how many books are in God's library. My guess would be tens of millions. But they record every single act, every single action, every single work of every single human. I don't know what your book looks like. Hand me a book. Okay, this is a book. Happens to be a Bible, but could be any book, couldn't it? Looking at it like that, just could be any book. Maybe that's what your book looks like. Maybe that's what my book looks like. Maybe yours is a whole set of volumes. Maybe you've got 18 different books. Just recording everything you've ever done. Everything. Every action. Jesus says every idle word, everything done in this lifetime, good or bad, pretty or ugly, beneficial or detrimental, everything you've ever done is in this giant volume of books. But it doesn't matter how many good things are recorded in all of these manuals and books and recordings of your entire life. It doesn't matter how many of them are good because you can't do enough good to get to heaven, as we call it, or be welcomed into God's presence for all of eternity. The Bible says, the Bible, remember the Bible? Yeah, this is God. He's speaking. This is a revelation. Of, of, of all of his character and nature, of his judgments, all of his plan and his purpose, and the revelation of God's will. And the Bible says, 
in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. We didn't save ourselves. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. So all the right works, if they all were right, See, and I've heard people say, well, if all the record of all your works were right and there was one thing wrong. No, you don't even have to do anything wrong. That's That's right. right. You don't even have to do one thing wrong. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How about this? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it's by grace. That's what God did. No part did I play in that whatsoever. None. Zero. The book of Romans chapter 11 says, if it's by works, then it cannot be by grace. And if it's by grace, then it cannot be by works. You can't have a little grace plus. It's either by grace or it's by works. It can't be both. So Ephesians 2.8 says, for by grace we're saved, through faith. That not of ourselves. that's a gift of God. Verse 9, verse 9, verse 9, Ephesians 2 and verse 9, not, come on, help me preach. Come on, there's like 250 of you, and, and I know I got a little microphone, but I can just go like this and, 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 and be louder than y'all. Help me preach. Come on. <laughs> Not by works. You cannot be saved by works. It doesn't matter when they open those books, when the Lord opens those books. It doesn't matter how many good works are there. You're either saved by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, or you're not doesn't matter what's written in the rest of the books. You cannot be saved by works. Otherwise, you could go to heaven and brag. You could go to heaven and boast. You could go to heaven and pat yourself on the back. You could go, go, go to heaven and <clears throat> just look around uh, on the millions and millions and millions of blood-washed saints who are there because of God's goodness and because of God's mercy and because of Jesus' work on Calvary. And you could go there and say, yeah, all of you weaklings couldn't get it, but... <clears throat> I did enough to get here on my own. You all needed God's help. Me? Let me just tell you about what I did. See, the song of heaven is going to be what he did. (laughs) Nothing about what I did. That's right. (laughs) Nothing about what I did or what you did. Just keep reading here. According to their works. And the sea gave up the dead in it, and death and hell were delivered up, the dead in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, if there's just one verse you take take away from here today, along with Ecclesiastes 4.13, take this verse away. And whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not written in the book of life. And so somehow we, we, we take that one verse and we just develop this doctrine about it. You've got to get your name written in the book of life. You have to get your name written in the book of life. And so we have this, this, this book of life. And, and there are all these, all these lines on there for all the people's names. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a line on there for your name. And when you accept Christ, you get your name written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. The thing we struggle with, though, is it talked about the, the book of life <clears throat> in Psalms, and Jesus hadn't come yet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it talked about being blotted out of the book of life, and the Savior hadn't even arrived yet. And it was going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later before that would even take place. And he said, he said, let him be blotted out of the book of the living and not be counted with the righteous. The righteous are those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and they are the only ones going to be left in the book. Well, pastor, that would mean that everybody's name's already in the book. That's exactly what it would mean. And you don't get your name added there by accepting Christ. You get it blotted out if you don't. Why is that important? We'll come back to that. (laughs) Psalm chapter 69, verse 28. Psalm 69, 28 says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Let's go back even farther. 
Should we go back even farther in the Old Testament? Yeah. How about Exodus? That's like the second book in the whole Bible, Pastor. I know. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 33. Exodus 32 and verse 33. And the Lord said to Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. I'll blot out of my book. Sin will get you blotted out of the book of God. Yeah. But the great news is God has provided the solution for sin, the salvation for sin, the redemption from sin, the forgiveness of sin, all through his son, whose name is Jesus. All through his son, whose name is Jesus. Look at uh, uh, Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Remember this? This is where the disciples came and said, it's so wonderful that, that, uh, that our uh, 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 demons are subject to us in Jesus' name. He said, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice in what? Rejoice in that your names are written in heaven. Well, well let's, I mean, how, why were their names written in heaven? Why were their names written there? He, he hadn't died yet. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. And he looked right at those people. Excuse me. While I peruse the memory banks for a moment. <laughs> Wasn't Judas in that crowd? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He was one of, the, one of the 12 that was there. And actually, there were 70 of them there. They'd gone out two by two, and that was inclusive of all 12 of his disciples. Well, I finally found a contradiction in the Bible, Pastor. Judah's name was in the book, and it says in another place he went to hell. Can't be both. Can't be both. And so let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got 12 blanks there. Let's see. Let's, put, let's just start with the names of the 12 that we know. They'd be Matthew, Mark. They'd be, excuse me, not Mark, Matthew, Luke, Philip, excuse me, John, Peter, Bartholomew, Nathaniel. There'd be Judas. There'd be the other Judas. They'd be those, right? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's, not, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's take your family. Stand your family up. Stand your family up. We'll, we'll, just, we'll, start, we'll, we'll start with them. Uh, uh, so, so let's just... We'll just start with you guys. You go two T's or one? Philip, you go one L or two? Thank you. Let's, let's, let's start with your family. You have to spell your name for me. Come on, stand up. Yeah, yes, you. Yeah. Yeah. You think your name is in the book of life? Yes, sir. E.L.? Help me. A M E. A M E. Where's Titus? Did he backslide today? Hey. <laughs> Titus, okay, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna go across. I'm gonna go across the room right there. Okay, I got. It. That's the book of life. That's the book of life. And your name's in it. And it doesn't matter if you're sitting here today or if you're watching today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ. You don't get your name written in the book of life. You get it blotted out. You get it blotted out. That means it was already in there. That's right. It has to have been in there yeah. to ever be blotted out. Yeah. And the book of Psalms says, 
Let him be blotted out of the book of the living. The book of Exodus says, God, I'll blot him out. The fact that they're already in there, well, we'll come back to that. There is one way the Bible says to get your name blotted out. The last chapter of the book. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22 even talks about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at verse 19. Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. Wow. If any man shall take away from the words of this prophecy... God will take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things written in this book. I would not mess with the Bible no. if I were you. No. I'd just let it stand by itself, not try to tweak it, not try to change it, not try to adjust it for my liking. Our God has watched over the recording of his will, written by the hand of holy men, moved by the Holy Ghost and has protected it right to this very hour. And it does not need any adjustment. Amen. Unless, of course, you'd want that to happen. And those not found written in the book of life. Your Bible just said at the end of the 20th chapter will be cast into the lake of fire. Why is it so important that everyone's name is written in the book of life to begin with? Because that establishes, that is the base and the foundation of the doctrine that says God's will is that all be saved. That is so good. God's will is that everyone be saved. It is not God's will that any should perish. And he begins by everyone's name in the book of life. And only by choices that they make to reject his son, to reject the gift that God sent, to do things as stupid, as foolish, as unadvisable as trying to change the Bible for their liking. As... Yeah, maybe we shouldn't get into taking the mark of the beast and, and, and uh, uh, willful sinning and, and, and things of that nature. But the, 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 the truth of this passage is 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, it's God's will that everyone be saved. John 3, 16, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would never perish but have everlasting life. The truth of Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, in, in, in Romans, I'm going to find you the reference here, uh, right at the end of, of, of Romans chapter 11, it says in verse 32, God has concluded everyone to be an unbelief so that he might have mercy on them all. See, it's not ever been God's will to have this category of people. Well, it's my will to save them, but it's not my will to save others. People, people put, put this, this, this judgmental finger even to whole nations. That Well, you can't tell me that it's God's will for that nationality to be saved. See, God's will is that all be saved. Don't change that in your Bible. God's will is that all be saved. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, he's not even willing that one should perish. Not even one. But that's not going to be ultimately up to God. That, that's going to ultimately be up to the choice that human beings make. Now, I've got to get, get moving or, 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 or I'm going uh, to run out of time before I get to my next principle. Let's look at the last one here. The very last one, he says, and I will confess his name before my father. He that overcomes will be clothed in white raiment. 
will be clothed in white raiment. Look at Revelation 19 and verse 8. That'll tell you what that's all about. She'll put it right up on the screen for us. Revelation 19 and verse 8. And this is the marriage supper of the Lamb where it's taken place. And to her, that's the bride of Christ, her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You're going to get a garment when you go to heaven that is not soiled, not wrinkled, not stained, not blotted. No blotch on it of any kind. It's going to be pure white. And that speaks of the righteousness of of the saints. That's the righteousness of God that comes to us only through the work of Christ Jesus, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. In him, the gift of righteousness, Romans 5, 17 says, and that comes only through Jesus. That comes only through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. He says there, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I'm going to have him put a couple other verses up on the screen. Uh, Matthew 10, 33. Matthew 10, 33. And then Mark 8, 38. <clears throat> Matthew 10, 33. Whoever shall deny me before men, I'll deny him before my father in heaven. Whoever will deny me before men, I'll deny before my Father in heaven. And then Matthew chapter, excuse me, Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Whoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Don't ever be ashamed of being a Christian. Don't ever be ashamed of the Word of God. Don't ever be ashamed to be counted in the assembly of the just. Don't ever be ashamed of the name that's above every name. I know there are people, maybe you're related to them, maybe you live near them, maybe you work with them, maybe you go to school with them. Don't ever be ashamed of the Lord Jesus. These verses are in the Bible for you, they're in the Bible for all of us. He said, yeah, of, of this particular church and of them, I will confess their name before my Father and before his angels. It's in the Bible. Thank God for the Bible. And verse 7 starts the, the, uh, the, the sixth of the seven churches. And unto the messenger of the church in Philadelphia. Now that's not in Pennsylvania, <laughs> by the way. Uh, ancient city uh, there in the Mediterranean area. Uh, and, and, and they had a church there. They had an assembly of Christians that on the Lord's Day, just like we're doing today, would come together and they'd sing together and they'd worship God together and they'd pray together and they'd encourage one another and, and, and they, they, they'd listen to their Bible teaching. And, and this messenger is, is, is told, right, this messenger being John, the messenger of that church, the, the messenger of the church at Philadelphia, to him write, these things saith he that is holy, that is true. He that hath the key of David, that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. And then he's going to go on. Now we're, we're, we're going we're to do our best. We're going to do best, our, our best to, to finish up this week with just, just this introduction that Jesus gives himself to this particular church. But not just again to this church, let him that hath ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to all churches. And so he says, these things saith he that is holy, that is true, that has the key of David, who opens and no man shuts, who shuts and no man opens. One of the absolute cardinal doctrines of the entire word of God is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. That means that he's God, and that means that you're not. That means that he does whatsoever he wills in the kingdom of heaven and also in the populace of the entire planet in the kingdom of men. That God doesn't, doesn't need your approval. That our God doesn't need your 
vote. He doesn't need your appreciation. As a matter of fact, he needs nothing from you, <laughs> needs nothing from me. He does not need my agreement. He does not need my vote of confidence. He doesn't need my praise, doesn't need my tithe, doesn't need my worship. He doesn't need my service. He gives me the opportunity in every single one of those arenas and areas that I just mentioned to be participatory or, or to, to, to neglect him, to neglect his cause, to turn my back on him and to ignore him. He allows me to either make him to be the focus of my life and to love him with all my heart. He gives me the opportunity to accept his gift or accept his gifts, gives me the opportunity to represent him, serve him, gives me the opportunity to be the recipient of everlasting life, but never forces me to do one of those things, not even one. Not even one. No, not one. Now, let's just look at, let's just look at a couple of verses here before we depart and dismiss. That's like my second warning. <laughs> <clears throat> takes me a long time in the glide path. So, so, so please keep your seatbelts fastened. Put your tray tables up. We'll be landing shortly. Did you ever get that message? It's like an hour and a half later, you finally touch down. All right. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Come on. The, the, God is God. Say it. God is God. You might just look at somebody close by and say, that means you're not. That means I'm not. That means none of us are. That means the corporate of all of humanity together isn't. That, that, that means if a whole bunch of people get together and say, we can do what we want, God's going to show them, no, you can't. They can build a tower up into heaven if you think you want to, old Babel, and, and, and everything will end up in confusion. No, if God resists you, you don't have a hope. These people that teach that God is your enemy and God is against you and God is angry at you and God's mad at you and, and God's against you. Listen, if, 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 if God's against you, if the Almighty is against you, if El Elyon is against you, if Jehovah is against you, don't come to me and ask for me to pray for you. Don't, I don't want me anywhere near you. If, if you just don't, don't come running to my office. If the sky's going to fall on you, I don't want to be anywhere around. I got enough of that self-preservation left in myself. To <laughs> no, I'll help you. Repent. Yes. Cry out for his mercy. Run to his throne. Yes. Yes. No, God's not against you. God's not your enemy. God's the greatest ally you'll ever have. And don't be worried about, how do I get God on my side? Forget about God on your side. Get on his side. He's God. You're not. You're created being. And, 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 and none of us ought to ever forget. God is God. God does as he pleases in the kingdom of men and in heaven. Chapter 9 of, what, of which book? Romans. Romans chapter 9. And Paul is doing, this, doing this, this, this outstanding job, this anointed job, this, this heavenly inspired job of going down through and talking about the ordination of God and the choices of God and the will of God being done. See, we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we pray that. We pray, will of the Lord be done. That's just kind of like the last straw, you know. It is. The book of Acts, chapter, chapter 20 and then into 21. And Paul's getting hard-headed and stiff-necked. Don't look so innocent. You know, he wants to do what he wants to do. The preacher keeps telling him, no, this is what the Lord wants you to do. But he wants to do what he wants to do. The, the prophet walks right up and says, you know, don't, don't do this. Don't go there. And I know there's a couple different schools of thought on it. I land very solidly on the one that he was out of the will of God. In chapter 19 and right into chapter 20 of the book of Acts, he says, I go bound in my own heart. Yeah. My own heart is telling me not to go. Yeah. Then he says, every city I go to, somebody stands up and says, don't go to Jerusalem. Yeah. Everywhere I go. But I have determined. Oh. It's a good thing to be determined, but... <laughs> Only if it's what the Lord wants you to do. And, and, and everybody, listen, this is one of the greatest principles you'll ever learn. Everybody else is not wrong. I'm just going to sit down and let that just settle on living word here for a while. Everybody is telling you the same thing and, and, and you won't listen to anybody because you know you're right. No, no, no. Everybody else is not wrong. 
That's an overgeneralization, I know, but everybody, this is what he said, every city I go to, every city, not almost every, every city, somebody stands up and says, you, Paul, you're not supposed to go to Jerusalem. <laughs> Everywhere. He goes down to Philip's house. Philip's got four unmarried daughters living at home, and they all prophesy. Yeah. <laughs> don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. <laughs> he won't listen to anybody. He goes out, and the big gun, God brings out the artillery. Now the big gun, Agabus the prophet, walks right over, stands right in front of Paul, takes his belt off, takes the belt off Paul, just pulls it off, and then wraps it all around his own hands and says, so shall the man who owns this girdle be wrapped up in chains if he goes to Jerusalem. Paul says, give me my belt back. I'm going to Jerusalem. And he does it. And he does it. You can do what you want. You can make up your own mind. You can be, you can be just as hard-headed and stiff-necked. You can be, no, oh, I am determined. That's just determination, Pastor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and Paul said, I'm going to straighten out the Jews. I was one. They'll listen to me. He never even got a chance to preach the first word. They threw him in prison. Now, you know what? God, our God, he can redeem you. He can redeem you right out of the prison. And, and most of Paul's letters, that's where they were written from. But he didn't have to be. That's right. They didn't have to be. He said before that whole discourse, I'm going to Rome because I know that's where God wants me. Where did God end up taking him? To Rome. To Rome. Even if you're out of God's will, you can yield to him and he'll get you where he wants you to be. All right, ready? Ready? He's, he's talking here, and, and, and one of the things in, in verse 11, for the children not yet being born had done no good, no evil, but that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, he, he, he comes down to verse 16. So then, th th this is... This is you ought to have this circled and underlined and brackets around this verse and highlighted. It is not of him that wills, nor of him that runneth, but of God who shows mercy. Now, the margin of my Bible says this. I'd have somebody come up that can read, but believe it or not, I can read. And this is what it says right here in the margin. It says, it's not what man wants, and it's not what man does. It's God. It's, it's, it's not what you want. People have, have for, for my whole life, talked to me about how, what a struggle prayer is. And how I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I never see any answers. See, see when, when you get prayer right, you quit asking for what you want. I'm just like you. I, I, I shop, uh, and, and I went grocery shopping with my dad the other day. I took him shopping, got a couple things that he needed, and, 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 and it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is one of those things. I mean, hairstyles come and go, and clothing styles come and go. Kids are always the same. It doesn't matter if you're riding horses and donkeys or, or driving in great big pickup trucks or, or hovercraft or anything. It don't matter. Kids will always be the same. Take them to the store in the shopping cart, and they're going to scream. <laughs> what are they going to scream about? They don't like shopping carts. Oh, no. It's got nothing to do with shopping carts. What's it have to do with? Come on. Huh? Yeah, yeah, so I, I want this. I want, man, you got it right. It's like. Ah! I said. Ah! And this little girl in the shopping cart, she's not even saying, I want the candy, I want the gum, I want the Cracker Jacks, I want the, she's just, she's just pointing. <laughs> and nobody's paying any attention, so. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming and pointing. I won't even tell you what it reminded me of. You know, this is Wisconsin. We had a big recall election. Now, I don't care how you, what side you came down on, of course, just an example. We elected a governor, and then a large group of people didn't like the results of the election, so they had a recall election. 
to get him out of office. It failed. He stayed in office, fulfilled his term. That winter, morning, Dad. <laughs> that winter, my dad had a sign out in front of his house, <laughs> stuck it right in a snowbank. You know, like a big, like a, I, I come around the house, I, they're selling their house. I had a for sale sign out in front. I didn't even know they wanted to move. <laughs> I got closer and had a picture of Santa on the front of it with somebody who had grabbed him by the back of the neck and it said, recall Santa, I didn't get what I wanted. <laughs> I kind of wonder, you know, not in this one, this is living word. I just kind of wonder in some churches if they just sold signs, if people would just buy them at their bookstore and just take them out. Recall God, I didn't get what I wanted. I prayed and nothing happened. The easiest way to get your prayers answered, the absolute easiest way to ever get your prayers answered is just find out what God wants. That's right. yes. That's right. Find out what the will of God is and pray it. There's, there's no struggle with prayer at all. Amen. I want what he wants. Yes. And, 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 and when I find out what the will of God is, discover what the will of God is, you're not, you're not, you're not having to talk him into anything. No. I know you want this, so this is what I'm going to ask in prayer. That's the easiest way to get constant, consistent answered prayer in your life. Find the will of God. Find the will of God. Ask, ask the will of God. So, so it's, just, it's not what man wants, and it's not what man does. It's God. It's God. It's God that shows mercy. I'm going to, I'm going to roll now. Turn back a couple, couple of verses, uh, ch chapters. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I quoted this verse before. God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. Yeah. It doesn't matter if every man on planet Earth disagrees with God. That's right. it, it makes no difference whatsoever. He's not going to change. He's God, and he does not need our agreement. Amen. Doesn't, doesn't need our approval. Doesn't need our support. His will is going to be identically the same whether I do it, whether I love it, whether I appreciate it, whether I walk in line with it. God's will is never going to change right. because people do, because society wants it to. God's will will never change. That's why the whole progressive movement to change our Constitution. Uh, I'm not here to talk about our Constitution, but that's what the move is. And the same move is creeping into the spiritual realm yes. of our society and of our nation. They want to change the Bible. Yeah. They won't change the Bible. They need to memorize, learn, and really let it settle on them what it says in Revelation 22, verse 19. Leave the Bible alone. The Bible doesn't need our changes. Amen. No, no. Galatians 1 and verse 1. Uh, see, I, this is all, through, all throughout God's Word. God is God. We were created by God in His image for a purpose and it was not because he's lonely. That's right. <clears throat> Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle. Paul, an apostle. All right, good, big deal. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. See, Paul makes this, 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 this statement uh, a, a little later on there when he says, I was called from my mother's womb. Verse 15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. See, it's, it's not what I wanted. It's not what my family wanted. It's not what the, the uh, council wanted. It's not what the search committee wanted. Uh, it didn't come by man and it didn't come by men. It didn't come by any single person. It didn't come by any group of people. It came because God wanted it to. And that's why it came. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Uh, uh, you who keep lists of my favorite things, you know this is one of my favorites. It's the one highlighted. It's the one underlined. It's the one circled. It's the one with brackets around it. A double underline. In whom we have obtained an inheritance. Did I say verse 11? Yes. Ephesians chapter 3. Get this into your heart. Get this into your mind. Get this into your life unshakably. That, that it says we've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him. According to the purpose of him that what? According to the purpose of him that works all things, Ephesians 1.11, if it's working, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Our God works everything 
everything according to the counsel of His own will. This is known in the Bible as the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. We looked at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35 where Nebuchadnezzar says he does what he wants. He does what he wills. He's God. He's the only perfect one. He's the only all-wise one. He's the only one who's the consummate of all knowledge and all understanding. You know, he's the only one who knows the end from the beginning and who knows the future from the past. He's the only one with perfect recall. He's the only one who commands the armies of heaven. He is our God. I'm just going to read to you uh, the, the, the definition uh, uh, that, 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 that we have here um, from one of the best commentaries that was, that was ever written. And Adam Clark wrote a general definition. As far as human words dare to attempt to give one of God, the eternal. Now, in the beginning, God, the fourth word of the Bible, Elohim. And he said, I'm going to just, in his, in his commentary, he said, I'm, I'm going to just give a definition of that word as far as mere human words dare to give one. The eternal, independent, self-existent being, the being whose purposes and actions spring only from himself, without foreign motive or influence. He who is absolute in dominion, most pure, most simple, and most spiritual of all essences, infinitely benevolent, infinitely beneficial, infinitely true, holy, the cause of all being and life, the upholder of all things, infinitely happy, infinitely perfect, eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing that he has made, unlimited in his immensity, inconceivable in his mode of existence, indescribable in his essence, known fully only to himself, infinitely wise, cannot err or be deceived, infinite in his goodness, can do nothing but what is eternally just and what is eternally right. That's as, as far as mere human words can dare to define the term God. And God works all things after the counsel of his own will. And he does in heaven and on the earth in accordance with, with his own will. Uh, Romans chapter 11. I want you to turn back here with me at several verses. Romans chapter 11. As you're turning there, uh, I'll just remind all of us of, of God's conversation with Job. God's conversation with Job, and Job was pleading his own case and talking about how smart he is and, and how wise he was. Now, none of this was his fault, and he didn't have any blame in it at all, and, and it was all something else, and why wasn't God fair to me? And, and, and God said, all right, all right, uh, stand up, stand up. Stand up, pull your britches up, yeah. cinch your belt up and be like a man and stand there and listen to me. Yeah. And by the time God, God got done with like a half a chapter, Job just was hanging his head and saying, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. If you ask me 1,000 questions, I couldn't answer one. I couldn't even answer you one. You're God and, and, and I'm a human being. God started out with this. Where were you when I created everything? Where were you? You think, you, 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 well, God needs me. God doesn't need anything. God needs nothing. Well, he needs our, no, he doesn't need anything of us. God is God. And God is sovereign and God is eternal. And somehow, dear little old God, in the trillions and trillions and hundreds of trillions of human years of time that have already existed, which have no beginning, God was there and got along without humans that whole time. Think about it. Got along without human beings, got along without anything that we can do or provide. Now, I'm not minimizing everything that you can do for our Lord, and, I'm not, and I'll, get, I'll get to that before we close. But too long, I've heard false doctrine like, well, God needs our praise. God doesn't need our praise. Well, God needs our help. You don't need our help to do anything. You've got 50 million angels that'll do anything he asks without asking why. <laughs> Come on. Amen. Amen. Where were you when I created it? Where's, what's the foundation that holds the earth in its place? Tell me. Where are the pillars that hold it in its spot? Tell me. 
The Lord just started asking him. He started asking him. How is it that the atmosphere just is held in place invisibly? How is it that the oxygen is only here where we need it? How is it that, he's just asking all throughout nature, and, and, and Job just finally hung his head and said, you are too wonderful even for me to consider. Pretty wise man by the time he got to the, to the end of the book. All right, where, where, where do we turn? Where do we turn? Romans 11. Romans 11. I already read to you verse 32. Look at verse 33. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the most in agreement with, with all theologians and historians, the most educated man on the planet. And he comes down to the end after fighting his way through Romans chapter 3 and 4 and 5, Romans chapter 6, and Romans especially 7, and then 8, and then 9, where he talks about the potter and the clay. Listen, before you, before you go on and read it, Romans chapter 9 is where the Apostle Paul, he uses the clay and, and the, the, the potter's wheel. And, and you've seen some artwork done in that, that he's the potter, you're the clay. And, and that comes out of Romans chapter 9. And... In Romans chapter 9, he says, who are you? Who are you, O vain man, to complain against the potter? You're a lump of clay. Right. And, and, and thank God that he decided to create you, and your parents gave you the outward part of your body, your bones and ligaments and muscles and all those things. That came from your mom and dad. Uh, and, 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 but the spirit came from God. God is the father of spirits, Hebrews chapter 12. And, and Ecclesiastes chapter 12, that then shall the dust return back to the earth from whence it came, and the spirit shall return to the God who gave it. The eternal part of you that's looking out through those two eyeballs. The eternal part of you that will live forever. You're a product of the eternal God. With a will for your life. And if he chose you to be who you are and born at the time you are, why argue and why fuss and why fight with him about it? And he said, when you take a piece of clay and you, you mold that clay and make that clay and you're a potter, you set it on that potter's wheel and you sit there and you work that little pedal and it goes round and round and round. You take oil or water and keep it moist and make it into, you take this lump of clay and you make it into a goblet or a cup or a bowl or a, a saucer or a platter. And, and, and he says, who are you? Who are you to look up at the potter? that created you, and say, why have you made me like this? Imagine making a piece of pottery and it starts talking to you. Why have you made me like this? I wanted handles. Yeah, but if we gave you handles, you'd want a lid. And if we gave you a lid, you'd want feet. And, 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 and no, don't, don't, don't talk to God. It's not what man wants. It's not what man does. It's what the Lord wants. He works everything after the council. Can you imagine what the world would be like if he just worked everything after what people wanted? He works everything after the council of his own will. It's called the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And he says, Paul is coming to that after chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. He comes right down to the end of chapter 11. And he says, oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has first given to him that it shall be repaid to that person again? For of him and through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. That's His conclusion of all of this, all of the truth in all those chapters. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who, who, who can correct the Lord? Who, who, who can be angry with an with a eternal and with a, a loving God? God is God. And everything is being worked in accordance with His will. With His will. That's called the sovereignty of God. But there's another side to what we would call the completion 
of theological understanding. And if you don't have this, oh, you're going to get, you're going to get all caught up in Calvinism versus Arminianism, and, and you're going to wrestle back and forth. Does everything happen? Is everything that happens the will of God? Oh, no. No. Because what the Bible teaches in its entirety, what the Bible teaches is the sovereignty of God and the accountability of man. That's, right. That's, that, right. that's the entire Bible. The sovereignty of God and the accountability of man. And so that there's an accountability in man, God has given human beings something called the freedom of choice. Given them a free will. Every single one of you have a free will. I think we dismissed all the little kitties, and so I'd say you're here because you want to be. You're here because you, 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 you chose to be. You're in church. You worship God because you don't know what people will think if you don't. No, you worship God because it's a choice. And the things that you do in loving our God and studying after our God to find out what His will is, you're accountable for that. And it's the same for every single solitary human being. And on one side, you have the sovereignty of God. And on the other, you have your free will. And you're a free moral agent. And you have the ability to make choices. And so God says, I set before you this day life, death, blessing, cursing. And then what's he say? Choose, Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. But you have the choice. And every human being can have the, has the choice to either accept God's goodness, God's mercy, God's free gift of salvation, or reject it. And because you have the choice, now you're accountable. Now you're accountable. See, people think it's such a wonderful thing that God's given me a free will and I can do what I want, when I want, to whomever I want. You can. You go to jail for some of it. But you can do what you want. You have the freedom to make your choices, and, and, and people celebrate that. Well, we have a free will. We get to do what we want. We can do whatever we want. God saw fit. He, he had such confidence in humans that he gave them a free will. Are you kidding me? Had confidence in humans? God has this confidence in humans. They're going to mess it up. Like every time. God's left nothing to us. The eternal, ever-living God has left nothing to us except choice. He gave us a free will. That's just a wonderful blessing. Really? The reason our God created every human with a will, with a freedom to choose, is so that he could judge. Without you having a free will, he would be unjust to judge you. But because you have a free will, now you are accountable and that's the sovereignty of God. It's never going to change. And we're accountable to be in union with his will, which he and his sovereignty chose for every human. You can yield to the will of God. You can do it his way. You can be like Abel. Or you can be like Cain. And you can just determine and decide that your way is better than God's way. You can do it in marriage. You can do it as a wife. You can do it as a husband. Or you can do what I told that young couple yesterday afternoon to do, and that's find in your Bible what the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, who created the institution of marriage and who gives you the manual on how to have a successful one. You open up the pages and you read what it says to wives and you read what it says to husbands, and then you conform your life to the will of the eternal God who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Or, or you engage your freedom to choose. See, your freedom to choose just says, I'm going to yield to God or I'm going to resist God. That's what your freedom to choose does. I'm going to go to church or I'm going to do something I like. I'm just going to sleep. I'm going to go water skiing. I'm going to stay home because I can do what I want. You sure can, but you're accountable for that. You can exercise your will and you'll be accountable and God will judge and he'll judge that you were obedient. He'll judge that you were willing. He'll judge that you were 
kind and loving and generous. He'll judge that you were faithful and consistent and persevered. And it's your choice. It's not his. If it was only the sovereignty of God, if that's all that the Bible taught, then you would never be responsible for anything. Right. You'd be a robot. I want you to come up here again and do that again. How'd you do that? <laughs> God, God, God would be responsible for making you and forcing you, and then there'd be no place whatsoever for judgment. That's right. There'd be no place for judgment whatsoever because you would be a machine. Yes. You'd be a machine, and a machine can do nothing wrong. A machine can only do what it's programmed by the creator of the machine to do. It's not the machine's fault. Well, let's get to computers. <laughs> My chainsaw does not start itself. I started it the other day, and uh, we had a big limb come off an oak tree. It was heavy. It had another tree almost smashed down, and I went out and cut it off of it so the other tree could go back. My, my chainsaw has never started itself. My chainsaw does not go out in the woods. My chainsaw does not notch a tree and fall it, and it crash right down on the house. And if I do that, I can't say it was the chainsaw's fault. No, I did that. I did that. It's a machine. It has no will of its own. You're not a machine. You do start yourself. You do stop yourself. You choose every word that comes out of your mouth. You choose whether to put your hand over your mouth if something's going to come out of there that shouldn't. You do that. You choose to forgive or you choose to retain offense, bitterness. You choose that. Now, that doesn't mean you choose everything that happens to you in life but you choose how you respond to everything that happens to you in life. That's right. You don't choose everything that comes upon you, but you choose how you're going to react to that. You can react in fear. You can react in trepidation. You can react by letting doubt, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Uh, or, 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 or you respond with peace. You respond with prayer. You respond with, God, you've brought us through worse than this before, and we're going to trust you again right now. You're the living God. Nothing's impossible with you. You're the, you're the provision and the supply. You're the director and the guide. You're the consummate of all wisdom, and, and you, you, you brought us through. We'll just look to you. Yeah, we'll just look to you. But when the Lord Jesus Christ... When Jesus says in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, when he says, I am he, I am he that opens and no man closes. And I'm he that closes and no man opens. If the Lord Jesus Christ closes the door, doesn't matter what I want, doesn't matter how much I pray, doesn't matter how much I fast, doesn't matter how much I confess, I'm never going to change him. And neither will any other man. And when the Lord opens a door for you, bless God, doesn't matter what people want. Doesn't matter who's against you, who's in support of it, uh, who, who's, who, who's behind you, who's ahead. It doesn't matter. When the Lord opens doors for you, no man can show. Absolutely no man can show. Doesn't matter who prophesies what. When God is for you, doesn't matter who's against you. And, and, uh, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. Now, there, we almost got the introduction done to the sixth church to the sixth church but if we've established anything today from the Bible it is that God wants everyone saved everyone he's not willing that even one should 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 perish not even one and we've established that he's God and he works all things after the counsel of his own will and the greatest peace the greatest ease you'll ever have in life, discover the will of God and decide to live there. Amen. And decide to live there. Discover the will of God and make that your prayer life. Amen. Make that your prayer life. If he says love one another, um, man, look around. Say, I, I can't love her and I can't love her. and I can't, Oh, yeah, I can love her, but, but I can't love him. No, he said love one another. Yeah. He just said love. Yeah. He just said love. Yeah, find the will of God and do it. Find the will of God and do it. It's not going to change. Yeah, it'll never change. It'll never change. Well, next week, we'll, 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 we'll take it up again. We'll take it up again. So we learned those two things. We learn anything else? We learn better, better to be poor 
and young than old and foolish, having refused instruction. Lord, we don't, uh, we don't refuse your help. And I don't know if you, you read your Bible this way, but it seems like every time I open my Bible, it, it's like the Lord just holding out a lifeline to me. Yeah. You know, just, just, just want to help you. Just want to help you here, son. Just want to help you here, daughter. I just, I just want to help you. You know, here, here's something that, 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 will, that will help you and assist you. It just seems like that when I open my Bible. Wow. The Lord's trying to get this to me. Get this to me. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that endures forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Father, thank you for sending your only begotten son. Thank you for loving us and having a plan for us, not just in this life, not just in this temporal existence that's like a vapor, appears for a little while and then vanishes away, but for all the rest of eternity. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.